excited to be here with you all to celebrate Christ's birth this evening as we move into Christmas Day tomorrow. And I was thinking about how we've been building towards this moment. We've been talking a lot about hope. And yet hope is only so important in our lives because of the hopelessness that we experience before Christ. And I was thinking about that hopelessness this week and heard the story of someone who knew what hopelessness felt like. Skier Francis Zuber was zipping down the tree-lined slopes of Mount Baker in northwest Washington one day when he lost control and ended up toppling into the deep powder of the trail. As he worked to right himself up, he noticed that next to him was a snowboard protruding from a deep drift. And this alone was an unusual sight, but even crazier in that moment was the fact that the snowboard was moving. It took him only moments to realize that someone was attached to that snowboard, apparently buried upside down in the deep snowdrift. So Francis worked quickly to take off his skis and to start making his way to the stranded snowboarder so he could begin digging deep into the snow. Breathless and weary, he kept scraping away at the snow, looking for any signs of life. He eventually pulled out a small yellow rescue shovel, getting deeper and deeper into the snow. Hold on, I'm coming, he yelled. Hey, you're going to be all right. Can you hear me? As he freed the trapped snowboarder's arms, he exclaimed, Come on, help me out. Are you okay? Are you all right? And when he finally reached and uncovered the victim's helmet, he said with relief, Okay, you're good. I got you. We're going to be okay. And he heard a quiet thank you from the man who had been trapped underneath the snow upside down. And they know all this because there's a video of the event I couldn't show it because there was some language that wasn't quite appropriate, but he had a helmet camera on as he saved this man who was buried upside down in the snow. The reality of why today Christmas celebrations mean so much is that apart from God, we are in a position like the snowboarder, helpless to save ourselves, buried by our sin, hopeless without God. Author Paul David Tripp tells us that the Christmas story reminds us that hope will never be found if you look horizontally. Truly, hope is found only when you look for it vertically. He says it's not enough to say that God gives us hope. What the Christmas story declares to us is that God is hope. So let's look today at the Christmas story in Luke chapter 2 and remember the marvelous hope that we have found in Christ Jesus' birth. If you would turn with me to Luke chapter 2, we're going to be starting in verse 1 together. And it will be on the screen behind me or you can follow along in a pew Bible. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 says, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all should be registered. This was the first registration when Quinarius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So this decree goes out for a registration that everyone who needs to go to their hometowns to be registered, and God uses This man-made decree to bring about his plans of redeeming humanity from their sins. To bring about the fulfillment of the prophecies from ages before. We're told in verse 4 that Joseph and Mary head up to Bethlehem to be registered there. And Mary is pregnant with child with the baby Jesus. And this journey was not a short journey. In fact, from Nazareth to Bethlehem was about 80 miles. It would have taken them an estimated 26 hours to walk. And they arrived tired and worn out in a crowded city looking for a place to stay. Mary is pregnant and they're unable to find any rooms available. And Bethlehem, that's the place where it comes time for Mary to give birth. I imagine this wasn't their plan. This wasn't how they hoped to give birth to Jesus. And yet the moment has come. Because it's not about what they wanted, it's about what God had declared and what God had prophesied through the prophets. In fact, in Micah 5, 2, we see that Bethlehem is named as the place where Jesus would come forth. That that would be where the Savior would be born. And so Joseph and Mary are here in Bethlehem. 
fulfilling the prophecies that the Old Testament had told about the Savior being born in Bethlehem. And it's there that Mary gives birth to Jesus, wraps him in swaddling clothes, and lays him in a manger. Not the ideal birth, not the norm even for that time period. The norm for Mary would have been to be surrounded by friends and relatives, women who were helping her through her labor, who were there to work in shifts to massage her, to support her, to give her a cool cloth to help support her in giving birth. But that's not what Mary and Joseph find their journey is. Well, like a good movie that cuts from the main storyline to a subplot, Luke does the same in his writing as he transitions away from the manger to the shepherds. Look at verse 8 with me. In the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them. And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling cloths. And suddenly there is with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. The shepherds are brought into the story of the Savior's birth. God chooses to use these shepherds, not because they were considered to be highly esteemed in this culture or this society, but God chooses to use them because it's part of his plan. It's part of his desire. The shepherds who were responsible for watching over the flocks of sheep, a job that at times could be dangerous as they had to protect the sheep from the dangers in the wild. A flock of sheep could range from a handful to over 100,000, as we see other places in Scripture mentioned. The shepherd is a role that many have tried to say was a despised role during this time, that it was one that was an outcast, looked down upon, one that was not given credit in the society, and yet this is who God chose to reveal himself to. We don't really see evidence of them being that despised in Scripture But what we do know is that there have been many people throughout Scripture that we've seen be shepherds. We've seen Abraham and David tending the sheep with Samuel. And we've seen Jesus use the imagery of shepherds throughout his teaching as a positive thing. The shepherds, though, were not considered the highest role in society. Whether they were as outcast as some have determined or not, it definitely was not a coveted position during this time period. And yet, that's who the Lord chooses to make known this good news on this day that Jesus has been born. And in verse 9, we see that he does this by the glory of the Lord shining around them. It's a visible aspect that the shepherds observe in their midst in this moment. The glory of the Lord come down to earth. And they're told not to fear. We see that proclaimed many times throughout Scripture as people come face to face with angels we talked about this morning with Mary that there must be such an overwhelming sense of the presence of the angel that the first reaction is to fear. And so often the angels declare, fear not. And this is no different here today, that the angel declares, fear not, encourages the shepherds that they come bearing good news, bearing the best news that there is. And they announce the beautiful news that the Savior has been born, this grand announcement that the Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. What an amazing moment for these shepherds to hear that the Messiah who had been awaited, who they had hoped for, who they had longed for, who they had prayed for, was finally here. Not only are they given this birth announcement, but they're told where it has happened, in the city of David, and that this is the Savior Christ the Lord. There is no ambiguity as to what has occurred or who has been born, but the angels are clear that it is Christ the Lord, the Savior of the world. And the, the shepherds are told that they'll be given a sign that this is true, that they will find the baby wrapped in swaddle and cloths and lying in a manger. Well, upon the announcement of the angels, the first response is a great company of angels show up to praise and glorify God. 
makes me think of what we're doing today as we gather together, as we sing praises and glorify God in celebration of the news that Jesus has been born. This should be what we seek to do first and foremost, is to give glory to God with our lives. The angels also come proclaiming a message of peace through the Savior. And this message of peace was significant during this time because this is a time when the Pax Ramona, the peace of Rome, was the rule of the day. One of the study Bibles I was reading says that the Roman world was experiencing the Pax Romana, the Roman peace, marked by an external tranquility. But the angels proclaimed a deeper, more lasting peace than Rome could offer. A peace of mind and soul that was not made possible by a governing body, but by the Savior of the world alone. And this message spans from the initial fear of the shepherds to the greatest message of peace known to the world. This message should point us to praise and worship God with the shepherds as well. Well, the ordinary shepherds received this wonderful, extraordinary message, but let's look at how they respond in verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told to them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told to them. And at the end of eight days, when he was circumcised, he was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. I love how the shepherds, what happens here is the miracle that they experience, the miraculous that they see with all these angelic beings gathering around them to declare the good news and to sing praises to God, that that miracle draws them to the king. You see, God uses miracles to draw us to himself. He's done this throughout scripture, and he continues to do it today even. That the miraculous is meant to be used not to point us to the miracle or to worship or desire the miracle, but to point us to the king, the one who provides the miraculous. And so the purpose behind the miracles is not to marvel at it, but to point to something greater. Eric Metaxas, in his book on miracles, says, that's the point of miracles, to point us beyond our world to another world, not for their own sake, but for us, to point us to something beyond, to someone beyond. See, we serve a miraculous God And the story of Christmas is filled with miracles. But the purpose is that these would draw us to the Lord, that we would look to him. And this Advent season, we celebrate the ultimate miracle, the celebration of the arrival of our Lord and Savior, the hope of the world. And for us now, we await when he will come again. In verse 16, we see that the shepherds didn't waste any time. They made haste to go and to find what the angels had declared to them. Jesus the baby, lying in a manger. And the shepherds, as they come, share with Joseph and Mary what they've experienced, what has occurred, and the news that they have received, causing those who hear it to wonder at the declarations that they make in this moment. Mary, though, is noted to treasure these things up, to ponder them in her heart. I think about the joy that Mary must have possessed knowing that she had been used by God in this way. To have it confirmed multiple times that Jesus was indeed the Savior of the world. To be obedient to God's leading and to play the role that Mary did was a gift straight from God and would be used to point others to Jesus Christ. Our section today in verses 22 and 21 closes out by letting us know that the shepherds return And yet as they do, they're glorifying and praising God for all they have heard and seen. We too should seek to be glorifying and praising God for what it is that we have seen and heard. At the end of the eight eight customary days, the baby is circumcised and given the name that the angels had instructed Mary to give him, Jesus. The story of Jesus' birth is just the beginning of what he came to earth to do. Jesus cares so much about each one of us that he took on flesh, walked on the earth, and eventually died for our sins. 
I want to point out three things that Jesus did for us that are life-changing today as we continue to look at this story. And the first is that as Jesus comes, he comes as the fulfillment of God's word. Now, I don't know about you, but I've had people in my life who I could trust, who I knew that their word was true. That if they told me they would do something, they would honor that word. And I've had people in my life who were the opposite, who would tell me something and I knew I couldn't trust them. They had perhaps lied to me before, they had let me down, and so their word had no weight to it. When we see someone who has that deep trust that we can know that their word is true, it helps to build and grow a relationship. It evokes trust between us and them, and we see in Jesus' birth that God is faithful to his word. He has spoken through the prophets for hundreds of years that the Messiah would come. The prophets declared that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, that he would come from the house and lineage of David, that it would be a virgin birth, and that the Messiah as he came would heal. And many more prophecies that Scripture fulfills. And in Jesus, what God is doing is establishing that his word is true, that he is faithful to what he declares to us, and that we can base our lives upon his word. Jesus shows us this as he fulfills the prophecies. The second thing that this text shows us is that Jesus comes in humility. Jesus comes bringing that sense of humility and humble beginnings. And we've all known people in our lives who are arrogant or who consider themselves better than everybody else. These aren't people who are necessarily lovely to be around. And Jesus, as the king of the world, as the savior as God the Son, could have come in any manner he desired. He could have came as a reigning king or as a warrior, as many expected him to come. And yet Jesus arrives with humility, recognizing that even though he is the king of kings, he has come to serve. And when one interacts with a humble person, we can't help but walk away affected by their humility. I was reading an illustration about Booker T. Washington that I want to share with you, showing his humility that reminded me of this today. It says, A truly humble man is hard to find, yet God delights to honor such selfless people. Booker T. Washington, who is a renowned black educator, was an outstanding example of this truth. Shortly after he took over the presidency of Tuskegee, an institution in Alabama, he was walking an exclusive section of town when he was stopped by a wealthy white woman. Not knowing the famous Mr. Washington by sight, she asked if he would like to earn a few dollars by chopping wood for her. Because he had no pressing business at the moment, Professor Washington smiled, rolled up his sleeves, and proceeded to do the humble chore she had requested. And when he was finished, he carried the logs into the house and stacked them by the fireplace. A little girl recognized him and later revealed his identity to the lady. The next morning, the embarrassed woman went to visit Mr. Washington in his office at the institution and apologized profusely. It's perfectly all right, ma'am, he replied. Occasionally I enjoy a little manual labor. Besides, it's always a delight to do something for a friend. She shook his hand warmly and assured him that his meek and gracious attitude had endeared him and his work to her heart. Not long afterward, she showed her admiration by persuading some wealthy acquaintances to join her in donating thousands of dollars to the institution. Humility is attractive. Humility is something that we love to see in others. We love to experience when people in our lives have humility. And Jesus is the ultimate picture of humility, offering his people a chance at redemption through coming to earth. He doesn't sit idly by waiting for us to figure it out on our own. But in humility, he comes down to earth and seeks to offer his help through his grace as he enters into our story. Which leads me to my last point, that Jesus comes to save. Jesus doesn't come to doesn't seek to save us from afar, but rather he enters into humanity to live life with us and to show us the way to the Father. I remember many of the jobs that I've had where they've been uh, out in like uh, food industry type jobs, and I've had bosses who are willing to enter in to the gunk of the work, who are willing to roll up their sleeves and do things like clean a restroom, and I've had bosses who would just tell everybody else to do it, who would say, I'm too good for that. I don't want to get my hands dirty, and I have the power to make someone else do it. And I always would rather serve a boss who is willing to work hard, 
who was willing to engage and do those tasks that sometimes people didn't want to do. Jesus, as our Lord and Savior, is all-powerful. He could do whatever he wants, and he doesn't just stand back, but he enters into our story. He comes down to earth, enters into our gunk, enters into our sin in order to save us from it. See, we are all broken and sinful people in need of a Savior, not a distant God who's removed and sits afar from us and we can't reach or obtain a relationship with. But we need a God who enters into our story, who knows our sins and our struggles, and yet is right there to offer us salvation through him and the work he did upon the cross. Jesus comes in humility to bring hope for the world as he offers his salvation. Jesus is the ultimate hope for humanity. He is the ultimate hope for all of us. And we experience that hope as we place our faith in him. If you already know Jesus, if you already have placed your faith in him, let me encourage you that what we've seen in Scripture is that God is wanting to use those who perhaps don't think they have much to offer to God. The Christmas story is filled with those who are the unexpected that God used to bring his glory. That even though it may at times feel like we don't have much to offer to God, God will use our daily faithfulness to reveal his glory to others. So may we seek to live out our faith each and every day by trusting God, by being aware of his presence near to us, and seeking to share the gift of hope that Jesus is with others around us. So may you move forward this week into Christmas tomorrow, celebrating the good news that Jesus Christ has come, celebrating the good news that he is the one who saves, that he is the fulfillment of the prophecies, that he is the hope that we've all waited for. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your presence here in this room. We thank you that you came down to earth and entered into our story, and we thank you for the saving grace that you offer each one of us. And as we celebrate your birth, Lord, May it not just be something that becomes routine, but Lord, may you move within each one of us. May we remember the sacrifice that you have made. May we praise and glorify your name as our lives are changed by you alone. We thank you for the love you've shown us. We thank you for the peace that we find in you alone, Jesus. Our lives are yours. We pray this in the powerful name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen.